so yeah, hi there to you at home and hello to everybody in the room as well. It is lovely to see lots of faces that I know. I've got my phone out because I'm going to start with a quote, a quote from Sangharachita, which I think will kind of help to set the scene a little bit here. So he says, given that almost everyone's life includes an economic dimension, work and career need to be integrated into life as a Buddhist. Most of us spend the majority of their waking lives at work. So it's important to assess how our work affects our mind and our heart. How can work become meaningful? How can it be a support, not a hindrance to spiritual practice? A place to deepen our awareness and kindness. So. As Dharma Sharlin was saying, we're on to livelihood and it's the fifth limb of the Noble Eightfold Path. Because this is the first talk, I'm going to kind of do a little bit of an introduction, but because I knew that people would probably be interested to hear a few stories as well, I kind of hopefully woven a few things about my own life and practice in there as well. So as well as being the fifth limb of the Eightfold Path. Buddhism likes its numbers and its little groupings of things. So there is also the Threefold Path, so the Threefold Path of Ethics, Meditation and Wisdom. And Perfect Livelihood fits within the Ethics area, along with Perfect Action and Perfect Speech, which I believe are the last two sections that have been covered as we've moved up to this one now. So I'm going to talk a little bit about perfect livelihood. So this is Sama Ajiva in the ancient language of Buddhism. So Sama Ajiva, and I'm gonna try, if I've got the time, to cover two sort of themes within it. So I'm gonna look at Sama first. So this idea of right or perfect and what that means when we're kind of comparing it to wrong livelihood or if, if we can actually separate that out. And I'm gonna look back to the Buddha for that, but I'm also gonna try and draw out what that means to us living here in the 21st century in the UK. And then I'm also going to try, if I've got the time to manage to fit that in as well, to talk about Ajiva. So Ajiva being the livelihood bit of it and the interconnectedness of all our lives and the way that we're kind of supported and sustained by the networks around us. So I want to kind of pull out that livelihood isn't just, I think kind of as, as Dharma Shan was saying, isn't just about what we're doing in our work. It's what we're doing in the rest of our lives. Yeah, so it's all of that. So as such, for some reason, I entitled the talk Tinker, Tailor, Soldier, Spy. Partly because Mike Sara said she wanted a catchy title for it. And I thought, well, there you go. That's, that's like, that's four, you know, different careers. And I thought, well, actually, you know, Tinker, Tailor, Soldier, Spy. They're all quite different ways of operating in the world, aren't they? And just to be clear to you all, as I start here, I'm none of those things, you know, being a spy, my, you know, well, I wouldn't tell you if I was, would I? Um, but yeah, so it's, it's the title of a book by John le Carré and also a film con with Colin Firth and um, yeah, Gary Oldman and various others. But it's also based upon a rhyme, which um, I remember quite a lot from my childhood, which was tinker, tailor, soldier, sailor, rich man, poor man, beggar man, thief. And my mum used to try to make us eat prunes and custard. And the way that she'd get us to eat prunes and custard was that your prunes would all be in the bowl with the custard over them. And of course, some of them would have the stones in them. And so you'd line the stones up on your bowl after you'd had it and you would go tinker, tailor, soldier, sailor, rich man. And um, however many you'd got, that was what your role in life was gonna be. And I just find that really interesting as a starting point for a talk, because even at that young age, I was kind of making judgments in my head about, well, did I want to be a tinker? What did that mean? Did I want to be a soldier? Well, definitely rich, you know, well, that would probably, you know, where would, where would you put yourself? Do you want five stones every time? So anyway, that's not really the talk, is it? So um, what my role is in the world. So yeah, as Dharma Shant was saying, I do have quite a kind of full on job, um, but yeah, I'll talk about a bit about how that's changing. Um, I started out uh, training as a primary school teacher. Uh, so that was what I was trained as. But as soon as I qualified as a teacher, I went straight into special ed. So I actually took my first job in a, in a special school. And as I progressed through my career, 
I've stayed within special ed um, and obviously my work has probably become more and more specialised as I've gone along and over the years I've moved from working in schools to working in the local authority and then from the local authority to a private company and then finally what I'm doing now which is that I'm self-employed so I'm a self-employed education um, consultant, specialist, teacher, psychologist, that sort of area of work anyway. So yeah, before I kind of we make any judgments about whether my work would be considered right livelihood or perfect livelihood or wrong livelihood, I just want to look to what the Buddha said about wrong livelihood, just to kind of give us a bit of a picture of what he was talking about and how that fits with what I want to share. So he said that we should abstain from um, professions that involve killing or the sale of living beings. So whether that's butchering, whether that's human trafficking, things like that. Also being a purveyor of poisons, which I think is interesting, or selling intoxicants. So perhaps, you know, being a drug dealer could be considered to be wrong livelihood. Mm -hmm. um, dealing in weapons, so weapons manufacture, or um, he also had questions about um, people going to war. So doing something that might involve killing people at war. So being a soldier perhaps. Um, and if we think about all of those professions, they all seem to have some sort of quality in them of causing harm to other beings. Interestingly, in the text, there's also um, suggestions that um, being a fortune teller, divination or astrology fit into the category of wrong livelihood. And I'm not going to kind of go into what I think about that, but you know, I'll just leave you as I kind of go through the talk to consider for yourself what you think about that. And also acting, interestingly. <laughs> and I'm really not going to say anything about that because I don't know whether we've got any actors in the room and I really wouldn't want to judge. Um, but I suppose when we think of right livelihoods, if we think of li livelihoods that we think are the good livelihoods or, you know, the really sort of worthwhile ones, they're often the ones that we get that get described as vocations. So being a teacher is described in that way. Working in um, the healthcare profession, so doctors, nurses, physiotherapists, I'd like to add there as well, because you can see a physiotherapist <laughs> in the room. Um, but anything that really, I suppose, is in line with your values, if it's a job that's meaningful and helpful, you know, those are the sort of things that we would say would be right livelihood. And for myself, obviously, you know, working as a teacher, working in education, when I have conversations with people and I tell them a bit about what I do, and particularly because I work with children who've got special educational needs, the common thing that I hear from people is, oh, that must be a really rewarding job. And actually, yes, it is. I do love my job. And it's one of the reasons why, as my life's changing, as I get older, I have continued to stay in that field. It is something that I really, really do enjoy doing. But at the same time, there is a certain complexity to it. So I'm going to tell you a little story just to kind of um, give you a bit of a clue into this. So where are my little stories? So uh, this one is from a number of years ago. And I'm trying to be really cautious that I don't kind of share any details that you know, would have people kind of putting it to a particular place or time. So I was working with a setting um, and it was quite a big setting. And the job that I was doing was assessing a lot of pupils in their school and trying to kind of put things in place. So recommendations, recommendations to overcome barriers to their learning, to help them to be able to cope better in the classroom, in the, the setting that they were all in. And I'd been asked by this um, this particular setting to actually go and work with somebody who was a school refuser. So this was a, a young person who'd been off school for a period of time and um, was really struggling with anxiety, really struggling to get into school. But they also wanted to have a look and see if there was anything with regards to the actual sort of this person's cognitive ability. So whether this child was actually, you know, struggling with any element of learning and that was what was keeping them out of school. So I'd actually gone along to their home and I'd, you know, done assessments and got to know them, got to know their mom, you know, sat there, had a couple with them and things like that and done my assessments and written my report with my recommendations. And then I heard a few weeks later, after I'd handed the report to the school, that they'd actually used the report to um, get the pupil taken off roll so that they weren't, you know, so that they didn't have to work with that student anymore. And I was kind of like, oh, right, okay. 
And then a little bit later on, um, I was assessing another one of their students at this time, somebody who's in alternative provision. And lo and behold, a similar pattern then occurred afterwards. So I wrote recommendations that were to support this learner and then found that they were actually taken off role and, and they had to look to find somewhere else for that student to actually do the rest of their education. So obviously you can see in here, there's quite a lot of complexity for me because there I was, and I wasn't self-employed at the time. So I wasn't able to make choices about who I went and worked with, but I was in a position where it was really getting quite uncomfortable for me. From my perspective, fortunately, I did become self-employed shortly after this. And when I was actually choosing what, what um, settings I then worked with, I was able to make a decision to no longer work with them. So the reason I tell you this story is because I think that on the whole, where we are at the moment in society, jobs aren't necessarily right livelihood or wrong livelihood. I think what it has a lot to do is about how we operate within that role, how we operate within that job or what we how we operate within what we're doing. So it's about our intention. And... So what, if we think back to what I was saying right at the beginning about this threefold path of ethics, meditation and wisdom, this right livelihood fits very firmly into ethics. So what I think that I'd like us all to be doing when we go off to, um, when I set you some questions to have a bit of a chat about later on, is that we're thinking about, well, what are our intentions within the work that we're doing and how does our work fit within the practice of the five precepts? So obviously at the core of the five precepts, we've got that quality of meta. So that's why we did the meta partner this evening. Okay, so meta, the opposite side when we have the precepts from meta, of course, is minimizing harm. So we're trying to minimize harm to other beings and to the planet. So if I reflect upon that particular role that I was in that particular job, obviously what was starting to happen there was there was the potential for harm to those people within that setting. Another little story for you that I'll share, um, this time from a little bit earlier in my career when I was running a unit for children who were autistic, but um, Asperger's. And uh, I worked there for several years and the job was a really, really challenging job. It was physically challenging for me. I got injured a few times and there was a period during it where I was actually being bullied by somebody within the workplace. And I kind of didn't see it like that at the time, but looking back on it now, I look back and I think, ah, right. There's also a lot of complexity about the students that I was working with and um, that the students had entered this this. Um, particular setting because they were primary age students and that was the age that I worked with of course they got older as people do and ended up we were stuck with this situation with these lads in the unit with me getting older and older and I decided I had to make a decision to leave um, that place partly because of what it was doing to me so it was for me it was about minimizing the harm to myself but also because I could see that I needed to push the local authority to a position where they would actually act and find more appropriate provision for these students so yeah for me I suppose there's an element in which the the local authority were not coming from a place of being particularly helpful or transparent in what they were doing. So again, that then is about where these other precepts that come out of that first precept, that quality of meta and minimizing harm come into play. So if we think about the second of the precepts, we're not just thinking about theft, we're thinking about places in which there isn't generosity. So we could be thinking about manipulation within our employment or if there's any sort of um, exploitation that's going on. With regard to the third precept, uh, the third precept, if we think about sim um, simplicity, yeah, and actually coming and trying to have a life which has more simplicity in it, which has more spaciousness in it, does our work, does what we're doing help us to come to a place of simplicity and, and spaciousness within our lives? Or does the work that we're doing create additional complexity? Or does the work that we do actually encourage greed and further materialism? The fourth precept obviously looks to truth. So the truth being spoken and heard. 
And so, uh, yeah, I suppose in that sense, we have to consider, that, you know, are we working ourselves in an environment where we're able to speak the truth? Are we working for companies that are profiting from dishonesty or lies or from half truths? And then the fifth precept, if we're thinking about mindfulness, um, I thought it was interesting. There's a sutta called the Digajana Sutta, in which the Buddha is speaking to Digajana, who is a householder. And in that, he talks about um, making persistent effort in our work. And I thought that was really lovely that the Buddha was actually saying to this householder that actually what's important within your work is that you're making effort so that you're working in a way that is diligent and mindful. And I was thinking actually about um, the times when I'm working from home. So quite often I will be working contracted for a school and I'll have a day where I'm working at home and I'm writing reports and things like that for the school, you know, to, to put together the recommendations or I'm creating resources for the school. Um, and just how easy it is that there can just be those subtle little work moments where I pop off to put the washing on, yeah? Or I kind of find that I've suddenly drifted and I'm mooching about on Facebook. And it's like, oh, well, actually, you know, this day and the time that I've put apart for this working day, these seven hours or whatever, is actually me supposed to be working for that school. And if I'm popping off and doing my washing or if I'm popping off and, you know, getting distracted onto Facebook, you know, am I actually applying myself diligently and mindfully to my job? So, yeah, I think there's lots of subtle ways in which we can kind of, you know, coax out, you know, what is there within our life? What is there in the way that we're working that sort of helps us to be more in touch with the precepts and actually operating from that place? So, yeah, our intention, I think, is very important. Next. So the quote that I read at the beginning in that um, Sangharach mentions that we spend a large part of our lives working, yeah? So the fact that we spend so much of our life working means that it does leave a mark on us, yeah? And that mark can be a positive mark or it can be a more negative mark and it leaves it physically on us in some ways and it also leaves a mark on our hearts and our minds. So... What I would like us also to think about, perhaps, is as well as those kind of intentions that we have in our work, is also to look at the tensions that are there, to look at what sort of incongruency there is, yeah? So when I think to that story that I was telling you about when I was working in the autism unit, as I said, uh, there came a point where I had to choose to leave. And when I chose to leave, I did that without any sort of safety net there. I, you know, I hadn't got another job to go to, but I just kind of decided that actually it was time for me to move on. And what I suppose I want to do here is I do want to kind of recognise my privilege in that because, you know, I know that that isn't the case for everybody. And so what I'm really not saying is that if you're doing a job and you're going, oh, actually, you know, my job isn't necessarily that skillful or those aspects of it that aren't skillful i'm not saying to anybody well i think you should just leave you know you know in that situation i chose to do that because i needed to do it for my mental health at that particular time but i think yeah there are a lot of tensions for us there and there can be a lot of incongruency for us but i think what is important is actually for us to actually have our eyes open and to be able to see what the situation is for us and to make the changes that we can make yeah because sometimes there are changes that we can make in the way that we work yeah but to also just be aware of it just to sort of see the reality of it and to sort of see the impact that our work has on it and to be sort of yeah just open and honest with ourselves about it I suppose so to kind of summarize that, what I'm trying to get to in this, I suppose, is that this word sama, when we're talking about sama ajiva, so right livelihood or perfect livelihood, is not to say that there is a perfect livelihood that we can get to. Instead, what I'm thinking of is the word perfected. Yeah, so in a way, there's a way that our livelihood can be perfected or can be complete that we can, um, we can have a livelihood that is fully reflected upon in some way and that we are understanding it and that we're conducting it, it with diligence and mindfulness and that we're accepting kind of the contradictions that are sometimes there for us and the, tens 
the tensions and the complexities that are there for us within it. With the few minutes that I've got left, I'd really also like to just explore the other bit. So Ajiva. So we have this Sama Ajiva. So Ajiva being the livelihood bit. But I think for us, we also, within the 21st century, we need to consider Ajiva in terms of the whole of our economic life. So we're not just talking when we talk about perfect livelihood. We're not just talking about the job that we do. Yeah, and the fact that we make money from it and we support ourselves from it, it's almost kind of like a bit of a two way thing. So you've got the way that you make your money, but then actually there's the way that you then spend that money or the way that you spend your life and the way that you interact with the world beyond that. Um, I was talking to Vasarada in the cafe this afternoon, talking a little bit about this, and he made a really interesting comment, which was that, if I can quote him vaguely correctly, we probably have less choice over the work that we do than over the way that we spend the money and spend the time that comes out of the work that we do. Yeah, most of us, we've kind of gone down a path with our work and we may change our careers over time. But on the whole, we're going in a particular direction. And unless we're self-employed and completely can go, I'm going to do this, I'm not going to do that. Most of us are going to be dictated to in some way in terms of what our work involves. But outside of our work, we've got a whole load of choices that we can make. And the choices that we make then have an impact upon the world around us because what I'm choosing to do outside of my work with my leisure time or the ways that I'm spending my, you know, my, my evenings or you know, the hobbies that I enjoy doing have their own impact upon what jobs other people therefore are doing. Mm -hmm. to give you a bit of a, yeah, to kind of give you a bit of a picture of that. So if someone chooses to eat meat, that's their choice to choose to eat meat. But eating meat therefore means that there is an impact because that therefore means that there need to be farmers breeding animals and there need to be people working in abattoirs killing animals. In the same way, if we love shopping in our spare time, and so we love like wandering around Birmingham city centre and buying lots of clothes, if we like buying our clothes from Primark or from, you know, big kind of fashion outlets, that sell clothes cheaply, we have to then consider that that means that somewhere out there that is creating a need within society for people to do the jobs that actually make those clothes. So can you see that there are those ways in which our lives are just so intrinsically linked with everything else and everybody else, and that in a way, livelihood, in the way that I'm viewing it, is kind of bigger and I think we've really seen that over the last year and a half with COVID, when you look to things like the entertainment industry and when you look to the hospitality industry, as soon as we take away the fact that we're not going to restaurants or we're not able to go to concerts or festivals or whatever else it is we like doing, those industries are just hit straight away, aren't they? Yeah, and they've been, some of them have been really, really struggling to survive over that period of time. So as we're coming out of it, of course, you know, you're getting told to eat out to help out or whatever else. But we all have choices. So we can all actually choose then how we want to spend our money, how we want to spend our time and what that then means for everybody else in the world. So I'm just going to place that one at your doorstep and leave you to consider that. <laughs> It is nearly half past, so I do want to bring it to a close. And I want to bring it to close with another little um, quote, which I think actually kind of sums that second bit up. It's from um, an author, a Buddhist author, who's called Krishnan Ven Venkatesh. I don't get that right. Krishnan Venkatesh, um, who's an American Buddhist author. And he says, we cannot run away from our connection to the rest of the world. It guarantees our existence. If we have a good job and yet refuse to think about where our food comes from, where the plastic goes, why gas can be so cheap and so on, our spiritual practice will be undertaken with eyes wide shut. And so what I'm kind of um, exhorting you all to do this evening is to live, live your lives with eyes wide open. <laughs>